Hello and welcome back uh, to this uh, eighth lecture on microsystems fabrication by advanced manufacturing processes. Uh, basically let us just do a quick recap of what we had uh, finished last time. Uh, so we had looked into the USM or ultrasonic machining process. We had also uh, tried to find out some estimation about the material removal rate. Uh, we also did uh, uh, and investigate this M C Shaw's model for uh, predictions of uh, material removal and did some assumptions uh, in this model where uh, we talked about that you know the grain the abrasive grain should be treated as uh, spherical and uh, also it should be treated as if uh, there are many number of grains between the uh, tool head and the workpiece. Uh, and also that the indentation uh, created by this grain would produce a, uh, a crater on the surface and uh, for all practical purposes we should um, um, uh, consider the amplitude of motion of the tool head to be constant so on so forth. And so there were a, a set of assumptions that we had made for predicting uh, the MRR or material removal rate and then we started modeling. Uh, to somehow to estimate what this MRR value would be. And in the process of doing that we arrived at a formulation given here in this slide right here where uh, we were talking about the ultimate yield is, uh, ultimate yield stress of a material uh, of the work piece sigma w and we correlated this to <laughs> the uh, average force that the uh, tool the vibrating tool head would give on the grains the amplitude of motion of the tool uh, a okay and uh, the number of grains uh, or particles making impact uh, per cycle uh, d right here was the grain diameter of the abrasive grains okay grain diameter h w was the indentation depth of the grain on the work piece and uh, this parameter here known as lambda was basically the ratio of the ultimate flow stresses of the work piece and the tool as we already have seen before in details that you know the ultimate yield stress is really inversely proportional to the indentation depth. So, we can assume that sigma w by sigma t <coughs> the ultimate yield stress of work piece to the tool is nothing but the inverse ratio of the depth of indentation of the tool to the work piece okay. and this we considered as lambda here which comes into this equation here and so therefore we have ways and means to predict the ultimate <coughs> yield uh, stress of the work material here let us call it ultimate uh, yield or let us say flow stress <coughs> yield stress of the work piece okay. So, that is how we have a very well defined relation between the various parameters associated with the force given by the vibrating tool head to the area of the grain which is really interfacing with the surface and the ultimate flow stress of the work material sigma w uh, which is in question. Now, uh, if we really uh, try to see what the z value is the grains per impact number of grains in contact between the work piece and the tool in one impact would be. So, let us say that if we assume uh, that the number of grains acting is inversely proportional to the square of diameter of each grain which is obvious because supposing there is an area like this on which uh, you have so uh, these, these many grains right these are the grains on that area and uh, the average diameter. Uh, of the grain is given by d as uh, we have predicted before. So, this diameter here right here is d. So, the amount of occupation of the grain area okay, would definitely be a function of the overall area that is coming between the tool and the work piece. So, this is the tool okay, this is the vibrating tool head and the tool is coming down like this and the grains are coming in between the tool and the work piece this is the work piece. Okay. And so, the the influence of the diameter of the grain on the effective area of the workpiece that can be machined which is showed by this shaded region is obvious okay 
So, therefore, if we uh, uh, assume that the number of grains acting let us say these are z numbers in one impact between the tool and the workpiece. So, if that is inversely proportional to the square of the diameter of these grains which also is signified or signific, uh, sig signifying the sort of area of projection of one grain. So, it will not really be improper to assume in this kind of a relationship. So, for a given area of the tool face, z is actually proportional to uh, inversely proportional to the square of the grain diameter and uh, also z would be proportional to the concentration of the grains in the slurry. Okay. So, if c is the concentration of the grains in the slurry or a concentration term. So, more is the concentration more would be the number of z's on the more, more would be the value of z the number of particles between the tool <coughs> and the shaded area here work piece. So, therefore, we can say that z is equal to some constant xi times of c by d square and uh, uh, we can actually substitute the value of z from here to here in this particular equation. Uh, so, the final form of the equation can come out to be square of h w is actually equal to 8 times of average force times of amplitude a times of grain diameter divided by pi times of xi and the flow stress of the material is nothing but the hardness of the material. So, sigma w and h w are kind of interconvertible. So, if h w times of c times of 1 plus lambda. Okay and where h w now this is small h w as you know is the depth of indentation. Of the grain on the workpiece surface. So, therefore, h w always becomes equal to uh, the square root of 8 f average a d divided by pi xi h w c 1 plus lambda. And uh, if we substitute this value of h w in the equation for q, you remember q earlier was actually <laughs> determined to be proportional to d h w to the power of 3 by 2 times of the value of z times of the frequency nu. So, q here can become uh, of course, we can substitute all these values here. So, the q finally after substitution of h w and the value of z which is actually square of uh, inverse square of d times c times of xi and nu of course, is the frequency we get q is proportional to amplitude to the power of 3 by 4 diameter d to the power of 1 by 4 the average force of the vibrating tool head to the power of 3 by 4 times of concentration to the power of 1 by 4 divided by the flow stress of the material or hardness of the material h w to the power 3 by 4 times of nu. And so, the rate of removal is through the direct hammering action of the grains due to the vibrating tool. So, this actually we can say as q direct okay. or in other words q direct is nothing but the direct hammering action of the vibrating tool head on the grains thus creating a ploughing action. So, as I told you there are two modalities of this uh, material uh, you know removal one is of course, the direct hammering action of the uh, vibrating tool head and the other. Uh, that is more important uh, that is not very important or not significant although it is to be considered in model is the impact that a free grain would have on the surface. Meaning thereby if the gap between the tool and the work piece is very high and uh, there is a possibility of the uh, 
or the abrasive grain to freely flow between the tool head and the work piece. So, the impact that the tool would give on the uh, abrasive grain would be converted as a uh, sort of kinetic energy of the grain and this kinetic energy would come and impinge on the surface thereby removing the material from the work piece. So, that is separate mechanism. So, this cue that we have determined now is really the direct hammering action where you are squeezing the grain between the tool head and the work piece and uh, you are giving a force average, uh, average force f average uh, between uh, the grain and the on the grain by the tool uh, which is creating a direct ploughing action. Okay. So, that is um, what the first part is. Uh, let us look at uh, now the second part of the problem and the second part is related to the kinetic energy uh, of uh, the grains. So, let us actually uh, try to model that part. So, some grains get reflected through the fast moving tool face. Also impinge on the work piece. So, we can estimate the depth of indentation in that case by looking at the following. So, let us say this is the tool and this right here is a work piece and there is a grain, there is an abrasive grain which because of the motion imparted by the slurry goes and strikes the tool in this particular direction okay, coming out of it in this direction and uh, we will have to somehow predict what is the maximum reflected velocity. So, this is the direction of reflection of the grain. So, the maximum reflected velocity needs to be somehow determined in this particular case. Okay. So, that is actually let us say y dot maximum. So, as uh, we know that you know the grain velocity here of the abrasive grain the initial velocity by which it is striking the tool is of uh, hardly any significance in comparison to the, the overall inertial component of the tool, because the tool first of all is very very heavy and uh, number two is it is also vibrating at a certain velocity at ultrasonic frequency meaning thereby that its velocity is also very very high. Okay. So, therefore, the, uh, the velocity the initial velocity of the abrasive grain as it strikes the tool surface here for example, in this uh, position a here is not really of great significance and we can say that whatever is the velocity of the tool head. Uh, is at that particular point of collision at the time of collision would be equal to the velocity of reflection of the particle. Okay. So, it is simply imparted there is no specific inertial component associated with the abrasive grain because of its small nature. It is few microns as I told you abrasive grains could be in the range of 20 to 25 microns. So, let us find out first the operating velocity of the tool head as a function of time. So, y t as you know uh, because it is a sort of simple harmonic motion uh, imparted by the uh, tool. So, y t uh, can be written in, in form of an equation as the amplitude of motion a times of sin 2 pi nu t. Okay. Nu is the operating frequency of the tool and uh, a is the amplitude 
and so therefore that is what the equation of motion of the tool head uh, would be. Okay. So, the operating velocity of the tool head would be dependent on this equation of motion here and so operating velocity can be written down as y dot t the first differential of y with respect to time which is equal to a times of twice pi nu times of cosine twice pi nu t. Okay. And uh, as you know here that at time t equal to let us say 0 uh, which signifies probably the, the mean position of the particular tool where the velocity is supposed to be the maximum. So, this value y dot t would be y dot maximum okay, which is actually equal to a times of twice pi nu. Okay. A is the amplitude of motion, nu is the operating frequency and so a twice pi nu is basically the, uh, the y dot max uh, or the velocity of motion. So, now we look into the aspect of the kinetic energy of the particular uh, tool once the maximum velocity of the grain is there. Okay. So, the corresponding k e or kinetic energy actually will be equal to the maximum kinetic energy because it is uh, half m v square v is the velocity of motion and v is equal to v max uh, corresponding to the maximum velocity the time when the, <coughs> the tool is at the mean position. Okay. So, therefore, the maximum kinetic energy of the abrasive grain I already explained to you before that uh, it really is nothing but the maximum velocity of the tool. The inertial component of its own self of the grain is so small that we do not really treat uh, that in this equation. And so, therefore, the maximum uh, kinetic energy of the abrasive grain is given by the term half m v square right. And m here because it is a spherical grain that we are assuming with diameter d we can assume uh, it equal to be the volume of the grain which is 4 by 3 pi r cube d by 2 whole cube okay, times of the grain average grain density uh, rho a. So, this is actually the density of the abrasive material. Okay. This is not really the number of grains per unit volume, but it is the density of one grain per unit volume of that material. So, that basically is the mass component in the motion. So, it is half m v square and v as you know is 2 pi nu a square, where nu is basically the uh, frequency a is the amplitude of motion uh, of the particular tool head and then this uh, is a characteristic property of the grain itself. So, if we really uh, try to solve this around we get a term 1 by 3 cube of pi rho a d cube nu square a square where rho a is the density of the abrasive grain. So, that is what the maximum kinetic energy in this particular case would be cut the problem here. So, uh, basically uh, now we want to really find out um, the, uh, the amount of energy which is really needed for indentation uh, caused on the surface by a flying free flying abrasive grain. Uh, that comes and strikes onto the tool surface and impinges onto the workpiece surface as a result of the reflected velocity. So, assuming uh, that during the indentation caused by such an impinging grain the contact force increases linearly with the indentation. depth the k e max whatever has been imparted onto the <coughs> grain surface 
or the free flowing abrasive grain by the tool surface should really be equal to half f i dash max h w dash. If you remember uh, the plot here cut So, in this graph here let us say we assume that f i dash is linearly varying with respect to the depth of indentation h w dash. Uh, mind you we are using different subscripts here because you know just to differentiate it from the case of direct impact where f i average and h w were the two subscripts which were used there. So, this is the linearly varying model meaning thereby that when the force is 0 at the beginning and uh, when the grain has not yet stuck. Uh, struck on the surface and then the force slowly increases because the grain gives uh, you know all its momentum all its energy to the surface and also faces uh, the, the uh, reverse force from the surface. And then after a while after the uh, full indentation has been realized the amount of force at that point can be treated as f i dash maximum. And then you can assume that the grain uh, slowly releases contact meaning thereby that it flies off the workpiece surface and it goes all the way to force equal to 0. Okay. So, the, uh, the area under this curve here showed by the shaded area is really the work done okay. the amount of work done because of which the indentation has happened. So, during indentation an area is actually given here by half f i dash maximum h w dash and so we equate that to the maximum kinetic energy of the grain that has been obtained before. Uh, so, therefore, you know we can easily find out. So, uh, sigma w which is actually uh, equal to uh, the also the hardness of the work piece. Okay. So, these are all flow stresses. Okay, uh, is related to the uh, maximum force at that instant of point when the indentation had gone maximum. So, f i dash max per unit area. So, at that time if we assume that uh, you know the total grain dia which has been projected onto the workpiece surface is, is capital D okay. and capital D is as you already know twice root of d h w where h w is this depth of indentation. So, if you remember the first exercise on USM that we had uh, done this modeling that how about a grain with a diameter d impacting on a surface producing a depth h w. Okay. So, there was a relationship between this, this capital D here the projected diameter of the grain on the surface and the grain dia. Okay. So, therefore, uh, force per unit area that you get out of uh, this equation where f goes to f i max f i dash max the maximum uh, force of the grain on the surface per unit the area at that time which we assume to be uh, pi capital D square by 4. Okay. So, we assume this area to be pi capital D square by 4. Or in other words you can have this as f i dash max divided by pi d h w. So, that is what uh, has to be equated to the hardness of the surface or the flow stress of the surface for the condition that the grain would actually produce some deformation on the surface. And uh, we already know from the previous equation that this k e max can be related to this f i dash max and uh, we would like to now formulate an equation for that. So, half f i dash max times of h w dash where f i dash max is the maximum force at maximum indentation h w dash. Uh, this can be equated equal to this kinetic energy maximum which had come from the last derivation 1 by 3 pi cube rho a square of d nu a square. Okay. And therefore, uh, also from the, the equation that you have derived earlier here in this particular instance let us call it equation A here. Okay. Uh, uh, from this equation A you already know that 
<coughs> fi dash max can be equated equal to h w pi d small h w dash, where this is the maximum indentation depth of a freely flowing abrasive grain on the surface. So, thus if we substitute this in this particular equation for fi dash max, we get a formulation half h w pi small d small h w dash square okay, half f i max dash times of h w dash is actually equal to 1 by 3 cube of pi rho a square of d nu a square and that way you can actually have h w dash as the under root of twice rho a abrasive grain density by 3 h w times of pi small d nu a. Okay. So, comparing uh, this h w dash that you have obtained with the earlier h w that was for case of a uh, you know hammered grain or a direct impacted grain, we find out that h w is very very high in comparison to h w dash. Okay. Um, you can compare both parallelly. So, if you, if you if you may just recall in the earlier case the h w dash uh, came out to be <coughs> this whole 8 force average a d by pi xi uh, h w c 1 by 1 plus lambda. Okay. So, uh, it, it really included a lot of terms uh, and magnitude wise this h w dash coming from the direct hammering action uh, is always very very high in comparison to the h w dash that you obtain by the uh, free flowing action of the grain. Okay. So, therefore, really the maximum material removal rate we can conclude here. So, the maximum material removal rate is highly dependent on the free flowing or sorry the direct hammering uh, action of the grain. Okay. So, it is dependent on the direct hammering action of the grain. So, it can be concluded that most of the uh, material is really removed by the direct hammering and very less amount of material uh, comes out because of the free flowing impact, uh, which is really not relevant to mention here also. And uh, from the earlier relationship, we already have seen that the MRR q okay, is proportional to a 3 by 4 grain diameter cap small d to the power 1 by 4 average force to the power of average tool force to the power of 3 by 4 times of concentration to the power of 1 by 4 divided by hardness to the power of hardness of the work piece to the power of 3 by 4 times of nu where nu is the operating frequency a is the amplitude small d is the uh, average uh, small d is the the grain diameter this is the average force and h w is the hardness of the work piece. Okay. And uh, as I already discussed that the q because of uh, free flowing grains the MRR because of free flowing grains is negligible. Therefore, this really is the MRR value okay. and therefore, we safe to say that MRR is proportional to the uh, d power 1 by 4 okay, where d is the grain dia. Unfortunately, that is not so, but because in experiments it has been observed that the material removal rate is proportional to the first power of d and not d to the power of 1 by 4 here. So, this was a discrepancy that you know arose from the Shaw's model. because of which uh, some explanation needed to be given. Uh, so, that somehow this uh, 
experimental data which comes out to be proportional to d could be easily fit inside the um, you know the, the data which has been theoretically derived by the Shaw's model. Okay. And so therefore, uh, Shaw actually tried to find out in reality what goes on or what happens. So, this discrepancy was uh, addressed by Shaw finally, by looking at the overall shape of the grain. Okay. So, Shaw actually looked at the grain shape under a microscope and found out that the grain actually is not a spherical grain, but a sort of flowery structure okay, on the surface something like this. Okay. And uh, what really was impacting uh, the workpiece surface was not this overall average spherical grain diameter uh, small d as has been illustrated in many times on the model, but this small diameter here okay, of one such you can say this can be a spherulet uh, <coughs> d 1. So, essentially this is uh, the diameter which would affect the, the material removal process and it would uh, in turn indent on the surface. The surface area also would be determined by d 1 and not d. So, he very closely monitored uh, if there exists a correlation between the grain diameter d and uh, this small uh, we can call it the projection diameter of the grain. d 1 dash okay, d 1. And what uh, interestingly he found out is that yes there exists a correlation where uh, you know these two things can be very well uh, you know correlated uh, as uh, d 1 the projection diameter uh, being proportional to the square of uh, the, uh, the, the average grain diameter uh, cap small d meaning thereby that if this diameter increases uh, d 1 almost increases as a square of this diameter. Okay. And therefore, uh, it is safe to assume that d 1 is actually equal to a constant mu times of square of d and this mu can vary uh, between close to 1 or somewhere less than 1. Uh, and that way you can have a very nice uh, formulation between d 1 and uh, square of d. So, if you actually use this, this let us call this equation b in the uh, the theory of q and q you already know is proportional to um, this now it is d 1 h w okay, to the power of 3 by 2 times of z times of nu. Remember this is the volume uh, of material removal and this d 1 h w to the power of 3 by 2 is uh, now indicative of the new projection grain diameter, which is actually the diameter causing the indent or the impact on the surface times of the depth of indentation h w, which does not remain uh, which remains almost same to the power of 3 by 2. Okay. And this is correlated by that formulation square of d is actually equal to 4 times of d 1 h w. So, we are taking the modified diameter of this projection, which is actually causing the indentation and uh, trying to find a relationship between this diameter and the overall uh, diameter here the grain diameter d. So, if you put this expression d 1 into uh, you know this particular expression here uh, you get uh, that of course, uh, h w as I already told you uh, for a hammering case hammering grain case can be correlated by this relationship 8 f average times of amplitude a divided by pi z d 1 h w 1 plus lambda. Okay. And we already know that z is actually proportional to the concentration and inversely proportional to the square of the grain diameter. So, if we put all these together on the equation for q, the q uh, equation becomes equal to cube of d times of h w to the power of 3 by 2 times of uh, psi c uh, by d square nu. Okay. One thing which is interesting to observe here is that the z value still is dependent on the uh, average grain diameter value for obvious reasons uh, 
that the number of particles which are making impact on the surface between let us say a fixed tool area and a fixed working surface uh, is really determined by uh, the area of an area of projection of an average overall grain. And the area of projection of an average overall grain is nothing but proportional to the square of the diameter, the average diameter of the grain, not the diameter of the projection. Projections can be many on a grain surface. Okay. So, that is why the z value does not alter, the z value is still uh, inversely proportional to the square of the diameter, okay, because uh, that is ultimately the determinant of what would be the uh, grain to grain spacing. Okay. The average diameter of the grain is the determinant of the grain to grain spacing between the tool uh, surface and the workpiece surface assuming a fixed tool area. So, therefore, uh, this expression here becomes conveniently changed and q becomes conveniently proportional to the grain diameter, the average grain diameter d, uh, which is in consonance with of course, the experimental uh, observation. And therefore, uh, this gives you the total prediction of Shaw theory towards the, um, uh, the different uh, uh, parameters involved in the material removal rate of a USM process. So, what I am now trying to, uh, what I am now I will try to do is basically try to evaluate some of the characteristics, typical characteristics uh, of how Q will vary with what parameter. Okay. So, let us actually write this whole thing down here. So, Q as you know now is proportional to D times of the average force F average to the power of 3 by 4 times of amplitude of motion of the tool to the power of 3 by 4 times of C concentration to the power of 1 by 4 divided by uh, the hardness to the power of 3 by 4, 1 plus lambda to the power of 3 by 4 times of nu, where nu is the average frequency. And thus, as you know that Q uh, would increase if the grain diameter would increase. Okay obviously, because there is a direct proportionality between the two. And uh, uh, if supposing uh, all these other parameters like the force average, okay, the amplitude of motion, the concentration of the grain and the average frequency, if they have increases, they would significantly impact the Q. So, the Q increases because of them. And if the hardness of the work piece is more, then of course, the Q falls down. Okay. So, Q is inversely proportional to it. And also, so is uh, true about the hardness ratio, hardness ratio and hardness ratio as you have earlier defined is very well defined as the um, uh, relationship between what uh, the work piece hardness or flow stress is with respect to the tool uh, hardness or stress. Okay. So, if the work piece hardness is more, it is obvious that the uh, Q or the material removal rate would fall down. So, that is in a nutshell what uh, the predictions of Shaw theory actually show and experimentally they have been many times verified by various people that these trends are actually true. So, we would now like to go ahead and look at some of the experimental trends of uh, <coughs> different uh, uh, you know aspects of uh, the, uh, the Shaw theory uh, and how actually and theoretically uh, predicted values would differ uh, above a certain limit of one parameter may be. So, one case uh, is uh, the MRR plot of with respect to the feed force or the average force. So, this actually is a plot between the average feeding force F average as you saw and it is obvious to assume that if F average is more then Q is more. Okay. So, theoretically predicted trends would look something like this which is uh, represented by this dotted line here okay. as if if the F average keeps on increasing and the Q should increase. But then what is interesting here is that above a certain limit of the feed force, let us say above a certain limit of the F average force, the uh, there is a depreciation of the material removal rate uh, and the material removal rate comes down okay, up to a certain critical feed force. And that happens because uh, of a very important effect which practically uh, you know almost always happens into in these USM systems which is also known as the grain crushing effect. Okay. So, if the feed force is higher than higher to a value that this F average per unit area of the grain actually uh, equals to the um, you know uh, 
the, the ultimate flow stress of the grain itself, abrasive grain itself. Okay. So, therefore, there is a possibility that the grain itself would get broken into pieces okay. and there is a crushing effect. So, the number of active grains which are now available at that critical feed force uh, would simply uh, you know uh, go down. So, that because, because they are themselves getting crushed okay. and therefore, the material is almost always uh, reasonable to assume that because of this crushing effect of the grains etcetera, the number of available complete grains uh, which uh, come between let us say the tool head and the workpiece are lessened and so would be the material removal rate and therefore, the actual trend of the material removal rate is shown by this particular illustration. So, this really is a critical force above which the grain crushing would start to take place, critical force at which grain crushing effect would be observed. So, that is in a nutshell uh, uh, what would happen to the trend of material removal rate with respect to the feed force. So, there are some other interesting factors uh, to be discussed. Uh, for example, as I have already pointed out that uh, with frequency, if the frequency goes high, uh, the material removal rate would go high. Uh, so, is visible in this particular trend here. Uh, of course, uh, you know the actual uh, very slightly from the theoretical, although theoretical shows almost a direct relationship, linear relationship with increased frequency, but the actual is slightly different because of uh, reasons associated with the inertia of the slurry and the inertia also of the tool head. Uh, so, is the case with amplitude as you uh, may recall that amplitude if it increases here a is uh, proportional to 3 by 4. So, therefore, uh, sorry uh, to the a to the power 3 by 4 is proportional to the uh, to the Q, the MRR uh, material removal rate. So, therefore, uh, any increase in amplitude would also record an increase in the Q value, which is true here. As you see in uh, one of the cases for a certain frequency, let us say new one, uh, for uh, you know an increase in the amplitude, there is a recorded increase in the material removal rate. And if supposing the new the operating frequency keeps on varying between let us say new one to new three, when new three is greater than new one, okay, uh, you can see that there is a double effect. So, one is the effect because of amplitude and another is an overall increase because the frequency domain in which you are operating and mind you frequency is proportional to the MRR here is also increasing. So, as you increase the frequency uh, the overall material removal rate with different ampl uh, you know for different frequencies that the amplitude they would have a linear increase. So, <laughs> we have already studied this aspect the feed force where you saw that there is a grain crushing effect which is there and some other trends uh, that can be useful are that related to the uh, you know uh, what would happen for example, with increasing amplitude and uh, feed force. And uh, uh, so, uh, this actually is illustrated by this particular figure here. So, with an increasing amplitude if the feed force is higher for every feed force there is a crushing uh, critical limit. For example, if the feed force is at a lower amplitude okay, uh, meaning thereby that the gap between the overall gap between the tool surface and the workpiece surface is lower. So, at a certain critical feed force value here uh, the grain crushing would happen and this would keep on increasing. So, the critical limit of the feed force goes on increasing as you can see here at which grain crushing begins. For example, at a lower amplitude it begins much earlier and at a higher amplitude it begins later and that is probably uh, obvious because the gap in this case between the tool and the workpiece is more and so uh, uh, you know uh, it is it's, uh, important uh, to see if the gap is more. Then the critical feed force which would be needed for having this grain crushing effect um, would actually be uh, uh, higher because the tool has uh, a higher relaxation time. Okay, for going from the, the surface all the way towards this other extremity the amplitude of motion is more. So, if you have more relaxation time then uh, there is a possibility of crushing to happen uh, at a higher uh, feed force in comparison to if you have less relaxation time in case of a uh, lower amplitude. Okay. Um, also important is that if the lambda value that is the work hardness to the tool hardness as I had illustrated before is increased there is a reduction in the material removal rate which comes obviously because of this equation here uh, 
as you know 1 by lambda to the power of 3 by 4 is inversely proportional to the mean uh, material removal rate q and therefore it is uh, good to assume that if lambda increases the material removal rate would fall down okay and uh, these are some of the um, relative material removal uh, rates for a frequency of let's say 16.3 kilohertz of the vibrating tool head and amplitude of 12.5 uh, micrometers uh, of the vibrating tool head and a grain size of 100 mesh uh, so you can see that for different work materials like uh, more brittle materials glass the material removal rate is very high which uh, effectively means that the uh, work hardness by tool hardness is lower in this particular case and if it is more ductile in nature as uh, is going slowly on a higher and higher scale you can see the MRR is reducing because of change of material here. Okay. So, of course the hardness uh, uh, and the brittleness both of the work material plays a very uh, dominant role in this uh, process and therefore particularly in MEMS applications or microsystems applications when we talk about silicon micro machining or when we talk about glass micro machining and uh, they are very very brittle in nature. So, the paradigm is really very high material removal rate which has to be well controlled. So, that you can actually have a small channel imprinted through a masking technology that will probably show at the end of all this fundamental process analysis uh, of the mechanical kind. Okay. So, that is what uh, how these processes would be applied to fabrication of micro systems technology. Um, and so basically there are certain other aspects which I would also like to point out here for example uh, let us say if we talk about how the variation of uh, material removal rate would be with the mean grain diameter it is obvious to assume that as uh, the grain diameter increases uh, uh, the, the material removal rate theoretically should be proportionally increasing as you already have mentioned earlier that uh, Q is proportional to the mean grain diameter D. But again the, the important aspect of grain crushing comes here because if the grain is too high in diameter there is a tendency of the tool to crush or start crushing the grains as you can see here. So, crushing of grains okay. and uh, the moment this crushing phenomena happens as you know the MRR goes down. So, the actual value of MRR for a higher diameter grain greater than let us say a critical diameter D1 here would be more uh, would be would be not following the theoretical trend it would actually start coming down. And so is uh, true with concentration. So, for example, uh, you know, if you keep on loading the grains in the slurry and at higher and higher concentration for two different materials, it has been proposed here. Let us say for boron uh, carbide with a different hardness and uh, grain hardness, <coughs> and silicon carbide with a different, relatively lower uh, grain hardness. You can see that with the increase in the abrasive concentration, uh, the MRR kind of plateaus. Okay, and that's because you can always between the tool and the work piece if supposing this is the tool surface okay, and this other uh, is the work piece surface and there are a lot of grains on it. So, you can only pack this area available of the tool to its fullest capacity. Uh, for example, if you load more number of grains this density of the grains uh, per unit area of the tool work piece surface would keep on increasing up to only a certain limited value beyond which any further grains cannot be accommodated. Okay. So, even if uh, the concentration is increased beyond that any further you do not see much uh, as, you know material removal because the amount of grains uh, which are uh, at probably the critical concentration here are fully packed into this area. Okay. So, therefore, there is a plateauing action of the MRR with a increase in concentration beyond a certain critical concentration. So, is the case with viscosity a very very important term for the slurry particularly when you talk you, you already know that at the very beginning I had mentioned that the MRR uh, in a USM is really dependent on how or what the constitution of the slurry would be uh, made up of abrasive particles and a fluid uh, medium. And so, if the viscosity of the slurry is more uh, meaning thereby uh, that the uh, you know interlayer shear between the, uh, the fluid carrying the particles are more there is a tendency that. Uh, uh, you know it will have a creepy motion okay, or uh, just like molasses it will move very slow and uh, because of that uh, all the material which comes out essentially because of indentation etcetera uh, 
would not be easily dissolvable in, in such a situation. So, uh, the diffusion gradients that need to be established should be very high for the uh, debris material which is formulated because of the indentation and the brittle fracture uh, do not get carried away very easily in that case. So, therefore, with an increasing viscosity as you are seeing there is a relative uh, reduction in the material removal rate as can be illustrated from this trend here very very important to know that if the viscosity is higher the removal of uh, the material debris uh, that would happen would be uh, kind of at a lower rate. Okay. So, that is in a nutshell what uh, some of the trends operating trends would be oh, another uh, interesting factor is what happens you know uh, for a brittle and a harder material. For example, in this case you can compare two such materials of average surface roughness values in microns between tungsten carbide and glass okay, as you can see here. And with the mean grain diameter uh, increased of course, there would be uh, a critical grain diameter beyond which there would be grain crushing which takes place. But what is important here to see that if uh, the brittle uh, if, if the surface is more brittle then the surface roughness value which would eventually arrive at would be higher in comparison to uh, a more harder material for obvious reasons that a brittle uh, material would be more amenable to brittle fracture and greater chunks of uh, uh, pieces uh, or materials would come out and they would form in turn larger craters and because of the larger craters the overall average roughness of the surface uh, would be higher. So, these are some of the dependencies of the various uh, parameters associated with the AJM process and uh, uh, what I would like to next uh, do uh, to today we are of course, at the end of the lecture, but we would try to design some USM problems and predictively ascertain what is the material removal rate which would emanate from such a design. Okay. So, in probably the next class whatever theory we have learned uh, by the N C Shaw's model of material removal, uh, where we saw that the prominence of uh, the direct impact or the direct hammering is much more in comparison to uh, the free flowing grains and the way that that removes material. Uh, we would like to now design uh, some uh, problems in a manner, so that we can estimate the material removal rate. So, you have a ballpark idea of what are the rates that we are talking about and in terms of uh, uh, the specific energy that is needed through this process as opposed to some of the other comparative processes we will try to compare. And uh, then of course, once we are done with all that designing and uh, the very important aspect of tool design would be taken into picture uh, and finally, uh, we would like to apply these to microsystems fabrication technology. Thank you.